Another major type of species interaction are symbiotic relationships. Now, there's a lot of organisms that aren't involved in any symbiotic relationships. However, you can imagine if you're a species out there and you're interacting with a, a number of different other species, and this is going on for a long time, millions of years, or at least thousands of years, then some of these interactions are going to develop in certain ways that, that one species is influencing another species to a great extent. And we looked at this same thing, same idea, in terms of competition. And we looked at it in even more detail in terms of predator-prey interactions. So now we're going to turn our attention to these symbiotic relationships. And as I said, some of these are very close relationships where one species is influencing another species. One population is influencing another population to a great degree. There's others where the association isn't so tight and there aren't such strong symbiotic relationships. So symbiosis is this general term for species living in uh, close to one another, affecting one another quite a bit, interacting with one another. So there's some of these interactions are beneficial for one species and don't affect the other species. Some of them are beneficial for one species and they're harmful to the other species. And there's some very interesting symbiotic relationships where both species involved in the, in the, in the interaction benefit. So we're going to look at, there's a number that we already mentioned before, but some of these we're going to look at today anyway are commensalism, where one organism benefits, the other one's not affected. Parasitism, where, that you're familiar with, I'm sure, where one organism benefits and the other one is negatively effective, affected. So that's plus for one and minus for the other one. Then there's some very interesting interactions, relationships that have developed over thousands of years, millions of years, where it's beneficial for both participants in this relationship. So plus, plus. It's a plus, plus situation. And we're going to spend more time talking about this than the other two. Although commensalism, it's, it's pretty interesting. Parasitism is really interesting. We're affected by parasites a lot. Some of the life history cycles, the life cycles of parasites are really intricate and involved and complicated because uh, of the environments that the parasites inhabit. And they're really interesting, really important. We're not going to spend so much time on those. And we're going to spend more time on mutualism than anything else because there's some, as I said, some really interesting types of interactions. So we'll look at these three to different degrees. First of all, commensalism. There's a number of different examples of commensalism where you've got one species that's benefiting, the other one's not affected. One of them is uh, it's getting more food, it's reproducing better, it's getting more protection. Something that's affecting its population you can think of. How is this species being benefited? It could be, there. there's two things, really, in terms of populations. Again, there's the birth rate and there's the death rate, the mortality rate. So the birth rate, affected by safety from predators, affected by food especially. If there's more food, more success in terms of reproduction. More predation or more vulnerability to predation, then your population is being affected negatively. So those are the kind of things that can be that a population or a species can benefit from that doesn't even cost another species anything. Well, here's an example. There's these crabs that live in, around these anemones, and they're protected to a certain degree from predators by the habitat that they occupy. But they're not harming the anemones. It's just a, it's a, a positive type of environment for them to ha inhabit. 
barnacles on whales. Now, there may be some slight negative effect on the, the whales in terms of their efficiency of moving through the water, but for the most part, these barnacles are just, they're settling, and their home is these whales, just like their home would be on a rock or on a piling or a, something that's in the water. So the barnacles get around, they're moving through the water, they have access to oxygen and food, and the, the whale's basically not affected. So the barnacle, barnacle benefits by doing things that it wouldn't be able to otherwise on a, on a moving creature, and, and the distribution and availability of food and oxygen resources in the water is quite a benefit, but it doesn't affect the whales. Mentalism. Here's another example. You've got uh, a cattle egret there. They sit on the back of the cow, not affecting the cows. And the cows are moving along, feeding on grass. So they stir up different things while they're stomping along and, and feeding. They stir up insects. The cattle egrets go down there and eat them. So they're just taking advantage of this disturbance that the, the cows are creating. But it doesn't affect the cows. But it benefits the cattle eagle. So those are some examples of the symbiotic relationship. And in this case, one benefits, the other one's not affected. Well, let's look at parasitism. As I said, there is so much interaction between humans and parasites. Some where we're infected by parasites, like mosquitoes or ticks, those kind of things, things that cause diseases. We're certainly familiar with that these days. And there's other ones that don't affect us directly, but they affect things that are important to us, like crops and livestock. So we're, you know, we've been looking at this predator-prey relationships. And so somebody might say, well, this is, a, it's a form of predation. You it's a form of exploitation anyway. It's a form of consumption, which is certainly true. And But in terms of actual predators, like the typical notion of a predator where you capture something, kill it, and eat it, then not so much. Parasites. But there's some parasites and hosts that have this long history of interacting. The parasite is affecting the, the host in a negative way, taking some resource, blood, or fluids or tissue or something. And the, the parasites have been affected in a positive way. The host sometimes gets a disease or anyway, if it's not a disease, it's losing some resource, or even a minor thing. So there's all kinds of different parasites. There's animals that are parasites. There's even a few vertebrate parasites. Most are invertebrates, but there's a few vertebrates, uh, all kinds of protists, fungi, bacteria. It's very common, this lifestyle. And there's different types of parasites. It can be internal, it can be external. External like a tick or a mosquito, internal like some kind of a path, uh, uh, a worm or a, a protist or a fungi. And so, as I mentioned before, the life cycle of these Parasites, sometimes really, really complex because you can imagine if you're in the host or on the host, it's a pretty easy lifestyle. You've got the food, you've got protection, you've got a habitat, you've got an environment. But you can't live forever in this one host. You've got to move on to another host. So you've got to leave this host, go out into the environment. Now, that's a whole different habitat, very harsh environment, extreme environment to have to deal with. Sometimes there's multiple hosts. There's a snail, and there's a vertebrate, there's a fish, there's the water. And so these parasites don't just move from one host to another. It's the same type of host, but different hosts. And in that case, you've not just got to go from the host to the water, but you've got to go to the host to the water to a new host, a different host. So in some cases, very complex life history. And as I don't even have to go into much detail, it's obvious to everybody that the parasites and humans have a very, very long history, strong interaction. There's endoparasites, like the 
protozoans that cause malaria and, and uh, a number of other diseases. There's worms, tapeworms, roundworms, penworms, flukes that uh, are parasitic. And then there's external parasites that we experience sometime. We try not to try to minimize this, but we've, we've all been preyed upon by ticks or lice sometimes. You don't want to be the kid with the lice on your head lice. Bed bugs sometimes. You don't want to stay in those kind of places, but it's uh, something you experience sometimes. Mosquitoes, hard to avoid. So we're familiar with a lot of these different parasites. We experience, you're lucky if you never, it's very unusual for somebody to expect somebody not to experience some type of interaction with some type of parasite. And if it's not you as a person being affected, then it's us as a population of humans. Our crops have all kinds of different parasites that affect them reduce the amount of food that's available to us, cause damage, economic damage. There's livestock that's infected by parasites to a large degree, and, and uh, it also affects our ability to have food. It affects uh, economics. The ranchers and farmers that are raising these crops and livestock, and so all kinds of different animals pigs and chickens and cows and, and uh, goats and all these different things that we raise and all these different types of crops that are affected. The trees that we're using for lumber and paper and plants that we're using for different things, fruits that we're feeding upon, vegetables, roots, leaves, all these different things are affected by multiple different parasites. So with vertebrates, there are see that things that are uh, affect humans as well animals and then uh, in plants there's all kinds of different things very interesting just to look at one example of this one year in Africa it rice this one crop that's affected by this this parasites two types of parasites that affect them rice plants. This is just rice in Africa. So you look at this economic losses of $199 million in just one year in just one crop in just on just one continent. So you can imagine if you extended this to multiple crops, multiple types of livestock, multiple continents around the world, what kind of scale you're talking about in terms of economic effects of parasites on humans and that's just the economics you know the, this rice is being produced so that we can eat it and potatoes are being produced so that we can eat them so it's not just economic effects but it's uh, ability to, to eat things as well and then once in a while there's parasites that affect some uh, something that we're raising that can make its way to humans be a negative effect in terms of health. Well, let's look at this idea of mutualism, these interesting situations where you have both participants in this interaction benefiting. So first we'll talk about mutualism again, what it is, what it is and then we'll look at what the benefits actually are. How are you benefiting? You can benefit with food, you can benefit with defense, you can benefit towards reproduction. And then the, the different types, different degrees to which these interactions are, are uh, involving these different organisms. Sometimes they don't have any choice but to be involved in these. And then with those tight associations with one population, one species affecting the other one, not surprising that there's examples of coevolution in relation to this. So basically, as we've mentioned before, this mutualism, it's a mutual interaction, mutual benefit. So both parties in this interaction benefit. Mutual, mutualism. It's a mutualistic type of symbi symbiosis. 
And with these close associations, sometimes obligate associations, that the, that the only pollinator is this one other species. So the only type of way that the, that the food is provided is from this one type of, of uh, species that they're interacting with. Well, with those types of interactions, very, very close associations, and there's uh, examples of coevolution that have taken place over the thousands and thousands of years or millions of years. So we'll look at that later on. And if you ask yourself, well, what is the benefit? Okay, so there's a plus mark. There's a positive for this species versus the other one. What is that that, is, uh, that plus sign represents? Well, there's a lot of different ones, and sometimes the ability to neatly place the benefit into one of these categories, the other one is a little clouded because you're not really sure. Maybe it's more than one. But in terms of the benefits, you could look at three major benefits. You can get food, which is important for surviving and reproducing. You can obtain defense which is important for survival, it's important for reducing mortality, the death rate, by this relationship. And then there's also dispersive type of mutualism, really, really common, where the benefit is being able to reproduce better, having a wider distribution, having your seeds distributed a longer distance, and or having some benefit in terms of reproduction. So the real benefit is sometimes, like I said, it's not just one, but maybe one is benefiting in food, the other one's benefiting in, in defense. So it's not always that clear cut that this trophic mutualism for both parties, maybe it's trophic mutualism for one, defensive mutualism for the other one, maybe it's trophic mutualism for one and dispersive mutualism for the other one. Either way, though, you're talking about two species that are interacting. There's a plus sign for both of these. Both are benefiting. So in terms of trophic mutualism, what are you benefiting from? You're benefiting from food, energy, something that you can use to produce ATP to, to power your energetic needs. It could be nutrients, not just energy, but it could be a nitrogen or it could be carbon or something that you need. And sometimes the mutualistic relationship is trophic for both parties. One of the species gets more food, gets more energy, gets more nutrients, and the other one gets more food, gets more nutrients, gets more energy. So, for instance, bacteria, there's nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the root nodules of plants that we've looked at to a certain degree, and we'll look at more later in the semester. These bacteria have a home, and they have a wide distribution in the roots of these plants. But the bacteria fix nitrogen. They take nitrogen out of the soil, out of the air, out of the water, and then they incorporate it into their bodies, their cells, their bacteria, they don't have bodies, and now you've got nitrogen that was just N2 or NH3, something that's not organic because it's not in a living thing, and then it's incorporated into this bacteria, and now you've got nitrogen that can be part of a protein, part of an amino acid, part of an RNA, part of a DNA, part of an ATP, organic nitrogen that's part of a living thing. That is an important function for bacteria. So both benefit because the plants get that from the bacteria. Then there's cellulose digesting bacteria. The bacteria have a home, they have food coming in all the time. If you're a bacteria and you live in the digestive system of some animal, that what a great place to live. You don't have to do anything except sit there and you get fed all the time. But these bacteria have enzymes that can digest cellulose, which is the major component of the cell wall of plants. Most organisms have very little capacity to digest cellulose. So if you're eating plants, if you're an herbivore, then your main source of energy is plants. You can't even digest most of the 
plant matter because you don't have that enzyme, cellulase. But these bacteria do. So you load up these bacteria in your digestive system, whether it's part of a stomach of a cow or a termite. These organisms that can digest plant matter utilize bacteria to do that. The bacteria can break down cellulose. Cellulose is really, it's a bunch of glucose molecules combined together. You can't do it yourself, but you have a, uh, a part of your digestive system. Our appendix used to perform a similar function, although it doesn't really work anymore. And so that's a, a very common, very important symbiotic relationship, trophic mutualism for a lot of different species, especially herbivores. And then there is uh, zooxanthella with the coral, dinoflagellates, these photosynthetic organisms that live in the tissues of coral. The dinoflagellates get carbon from the coral. They get nitrogenous wastes from the coral. Coral are animals. They get a home. They get a, a permanent place that's relatively shallow water, close to the sun, a good environment for photosynthetic activities to take place. So it's good for the dinoflagellates. The coral, on the other hand, has these little plants. Well, they're not plants, but they have these little photosynthetic organisms that are fixing carbon, making sugar, and the coral can use some of that. And there's a fairly large proportion of the energy that's supplied to the coral not by them feeding, filter feeding, and getting things out of the water, but directly from the dinoflagellates. So both benefit trophically. Here's some other. We'll look at, at ants. A couple of different examples of ants. Very interesting examples of trophic mutualism. There's these leaf cutting ants. So here's a picture of these leaves. They, they slice up these leaves and then they chew them up and they form this pulp and what they do they they're little farmer ants they have a farm of fungus and they feed this fungus this pulp that they produce by chewing up these leaves so these ants are providing energy to the fungus fungus uses those leaves grows using that pulp and then the fungus has these these uh, fruiting bodies that are like little mushroom kind of things or things on a stem that they grow and then the ants feed upon those fruiting bodies that are produced by the fungi. So the fungus benefits from the ants feeding them this leaf pulp and the ants benefit by feeding on the fungus the parts of the fungus that they're growing. So it's a trophic benefit for the Ants, it's a trophic benefit for the fungus. Trophic mutualism. There's another example. This is quite common in different places. You have these cleaner wrasses, cleaner shrimp, cleaner fish, where the, the big fish or the turtle or the shark, or the, the big animal that's coming in, sits there, opens its mouth, opens its gills, very receptive to these cleaners, coming along and removing parasites from them. They're going along, picking off these parasites. So the benefit for the, the, the big animal is more defensive, where they're having parasites removed, parasites that are potentially harming them. But the benefit for the cleaner, cleaner fish, cleaner shrimp, is that they're getting food. This is their source of food. And the big animals, they could easily eat these fish, they could easily eat these shrimp, but they're, they tolerate them moving around on their bodies, and they don't eat them because the benefit is in terms of having parasites removed from their body. So maybe not for the big fish or the turtle being a trophic mutualism, but certainly for these cleaner fish, cleaner shrimp, it is a trophic benefit. Here's another example with the, the ants. So we'll look at this in a, in a little more detail, and then we'll stop for this first lecture. But defensive mutualism. Now, you could also look at this as a combination of defense and uh, 
trophic mutualism as well. But there's certainly some element of defense that's involved in this and that's led to this establishment of this relationship. You've got aphids and you've got ants. These aphids, are they're, they don't have very good defenses. They go along the feeding on the plants, but they're easily eaten. There's a lot of things that eat aphids. They're not very good at, at defending themselves. But when they feed on the, these certain plants, acacia plants, then they produce this ex, ex, excrement, this honeydew. Now, we might not want to eat it. It's not like a honeydew melon, but the ants love this. It's energy rich. It's got a lot of carbohydrate. It's a sugar type of substance that these aphids produce. The ants feed on that. So for the ants, they get food. They get this, this rich source of food. And what do the aphids get out of this relationship? Well, the ants protect the aphids. The ants go along and fight off predators of the aphids. So they basically, they're raising these aphids. They're farming these aphids on these acacia plants. And there's a huge difference in the ability of aphids to survive and and, and, and thrive on acacia plants and produce this honeydew. A huge difference on acacia plants where there's ants and where there's not ants. So let's look at some of these, this relationship. What do the ants get out of this? The ants, they obviously get this food. They get this honeydew. And they have a, a nest uh, in this acacia plant. So that's where they live. The acacia plant is protected from herbivores because the the ants are going along. They're they're uh, trimming down neighboring plants. They're attacking herbivores that come along and try and eat them. So the ants get a home, which isn't it's not uh, trophic, but it's uh, it's certainly a benefit in terms of their ability to reproduce and survive. What the acacia plants get out of this is defense. They provide a home for the ants, but the ants provide defense for the acacia plants. And there's a big difference, just like with the ants and the aphids, there's a big difference in the ability of acacia plants to grow and survive when they have ants on them versus when they don't. So let's look at a few demonstrations of that. Here's acacia plant height. You can pause this and look at this in more detail if you want to. But basically, if you're an acacia plant with ants, you're removing the, the area of competitive plants. You're removing the, the herbivores that come and try and eat you. You grow a lot higher. You grow a lot faster. You grow a lot better if you have ants crawling around on you and making their home on you as an acacia plant. Survival of the acacia plants. Now, you don't have other plants that are trying to crowd you out, competing with you. You don't have all the herbivores that are coming along feeding on you. So survival with the ants as an acacia plant is much higher than if you're an acacia plant trying to live without ants. And then in terms of uh, being eaten, again, the, you have these new shoots coming off little little parts of the plants that are easily eaten by herbivores. Well, if you have ants, then the amount that your little shoots are eaten by herbivores is much lower. It's a fraction of what it is if you don't have ants. So big benefits of for acacia plants that have these ants. And in fact, if you go out to someplace like Africa and you look, here's an acacia plant in this picture that's surrounded by all this dirt. And this acacia plant has ants on it. What these ants have done is carved out this little area where there's no other plants to compete. This acacia plant has this, this soil all to itself because these ants are going around gardening the area. They're going around pruning and trimming all these other plants to protect the acacia plant, which is their home. So it's quite beneficial 
for both, and especially for the acacia plants, defensive mutualism. All right, well, then the last thing, which is quite involved, quite, there's so many different examples of this, is dispersive mutualism where somebody, one of the participants, gets food, usually, in the form of pollen or nectar or sap or, or fruit or seeds or something, some kind of benefit in terms of food that attracts you as a pollinator. And the plant itself, it sacrifices some energy in this pollen or sap or, or nectar or fruit. But how it benefits is you've got these pollinators that are going around from one flower to another pollinating the plants. They can't do that on their own. You've got these insects or, or animals that are feeding on these reproductive structures, flying a long ways, walking a long ways, moving a long ways, and then the seeds are dispersed to much greater distance than they would be able to on their own. So there's a lot of different animals that eat different parts of plants that are related to dispersal of those plants. There's seeds that are eaten. This little mouse eats a seed, it goes off and, it, and then it goes to the bathroom and the seeds are undisturbed. And so the, the plant is able to disperse much greater distances using animals than they would be able to on their own. What are they gonna do on their own? They're just gonna drop a seed, it's gonna fall right at the at the base of the plant or the tree. So there are a lot of just examples of dispersive mutualism with birds, with insects, with mammals, other kinds of animals feeding on fruit, feeding on seeds, feeding on on uh, nectar, pollen and being taken advantage of in a way or trade trade is that I'll give you some food as a plant but you have to help me reproduce. Very, very common in terms of examples of mutualism. All right, well, we can stop there for this first half of the lecture. It's a little more than half, but uh, when we come back for the second lecture, actually, this is the second lecture, isn't it? That, that uh, we can start up with this idea of obligate versus non-obligate symbiotic relationships and then look at coevolution.